Chapter Nine of The Road by Jack London. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine Bulls. If the tramp were suddenly to pass away from the United States, widespread misery for many families would follow. The tramp enables thousands of men to earn honest livings, educate their children, and bring them up God fearing and industrious. I know. At one time my father was a constable and hunted tramps for a living. The community paid him so much per head for all the tramps he could catch, and also, I believe, he got mileage fees. Ways and means was always a pressing problem in our household, and the amount of meat on the table, the new pair of shoes, the day's outing, or the textbook for school, were dependent upon my father's luck in the chase. Well I remember the suppressed eagerness and the suspense with which I waited to learn each morning what the result of his past night's toil had been, how many tramps he had gathered in and what the chances were for convicting them. And so it was, when later, as a tramp, I succeeded in eluding some predatory constable, I could not feel but sorry for the little boys and girls at home in that constable's house. It seemed to me in a way that I was defrauding those little boys and girls of some of the good things of life. But it's all in the game. The hobo defies society, and society's watchdogs make a living out of him. Some hobos like to be caught by the watchdogs, especially in winter time. Of course, such hobos select communities where the jails are good, wherein no work is performed and the food is substantial. Also, there have been, and most probably still are, constables who divide their fees with the hobos they arrest. Such a constable does not have to hunt. He whistles, and the game comes right up to his hand. It is surprising, the money that is made out of stone-broke tramps. All through the South, at least when I was hoboing, are convict camps and plantations, where the time of convicted hobos is bought by the farmers, and where the hobos simply have to work. Then there are places like the quarries of Rutland, Vermont, where the hobo is exploited, the unearned energy in his body, which he has accumulated by battering on the drag or slamming gates, being extricated for the benefit of that particular community. Now I don't know anything about the quarries in Rutland, Vermont. I am very glad that I don't, when I remember how near I was to getting into them. Tramps passed the word along, and I first heard of those quarries when I was in Indiana. But when I got into New England, I heard of them continually and always with danger signals flying. They want men in the quarries, the passing hobo said, and they never give a stiff less than ninety days. By the time I got into New Hampshire, I was pretty well keyed up over those quarries, and I fought shy of railroad cops, bulls, and constables as I never had before. One evening I went down to the railroad yards at Concord and found a freight train made up and ready to start. I located an empty box car, slid open the side door, and climbed in. It was my hope to win across to White River by morning. That would bring me into Vermont, and not more than a thousand miles from Rutland. But after that, as I worked north, the distance between me and the point of danger would begin to increase. In the car I found a gay cat, who displayed unusual trepidation at my entrance. He took me for a shack, brakeman, and when he learned I was only a stiff, he began talking about the quarries at Rutland as the cause of the fright I had given him. He was a young country fellow, and had beaten his way only over local stretches of road. The freight got under way, and we lay down in one end of the box car and went to sleep. Two or three hours afterward, at a stop, I was awakened by the noise of the right-hand door being softly slid open. The gay cat slept on. I made no movement, though I veiled my eyes with my lashes to a little slit through which I could see out. A lantern was thrust in through the doorway, followed by the head of a shack. He discovered us and looked at us for a moment. I was prepared for a violent expression on his part, or the customary, Hit the grit, you son of a toad. Instead of this, he cautiously withdrew the lantern and very, very softly slid the door to. This struck me as eminently unusual and suspicious. I listened, and softly I heard the hasp drop into place. The door was latched on the outside. We could not open it from the inside. One way of sudden exit from that car was blocked. It would never do. I waited a few seconds, then crept to the left-hand door and tried it. It was not yet latched. 
I opened it, dropped to the ground, and closed it behind me. Then I passed under the bumpers to the other side of the train. I opened the door the shack had latched, climbed in, and closed it behind me. Both exits were available again. The gay cat was still asleep. The train got under way. It came to the next stop. I heard footsteps in the gravel. Then the left-hand door was thrown open noisily. The gay cat awoke, and I made believe to awake. And we sat up and stared at the shack and his lantern. He didn't waste any time getting down to business. I want three dollars, he said. We got on our feet and came nearer to him to confer. We expressed an absolute and devoted willingness to give him three dollars, but explained our wretched luck that compelled our desire to remain unsatisfied. The shack was incredulous. He dickered with us. He would compromise for two dollars. We regretted our condition of poverty. He said uncomplimentary things, called us sons of toads, and damned us from hell to breakfast. Then he threatened. He explained that if we didn't dig up, he'd lock us in and carry us on to White River and turn us over to the authorities. He also explained all about the quarries at Rutland. Now that shack thought he had us dead to rights. Was not he guarding the one door, and had he not himself latched the opposite door but a few minutes before? When he began talking about quarries, the frightened gay cat started to sidle across to the other door. The shack laughed loud and long. Don't be in a hurry, he said. I locked that door on the outside at the last stop. So implicitly did he believe the door to be locked that his words carried conviction. The gay cat believed and was in despair. The shack delivered his ultimatum. Either we should dig up two dollars, or he would lock us in and turn us over to the constable at White River. And that meant ninety days and the quarries. Now, gentle reader, just suppose that the other door had been locked. Behold the precariousness of human life. For lack of a dollar, I'd have gone to the quarries and served three months as a convict slave. So would the gay cat. Count me out, for I was hopeless. But consider the gay cat. He might have come out, after those ninety days, pledged to a life of crime. And later, he might have broken your skull, even your skull, with a blackjack in an endeavor to take possession of the money on your person. And if not your skull, then some other poor and unoffending creature's skull. But the door was unlocked, and I alone knew it. The gay cat and I begged for mercy. I joined in the pleading and wailing out of sheer cussedness, I suppose. But I did my best. I told a story that would have melted the heart of any mug, but it didn't melt the heart of that sordid money grasper of a shack. When he became convinced that we didn't have any money, he slid the door shut and latched it, then lingered a moment on the chance that we had fooled him and that we would now offer him the two dollars. Then it was that I let out a few links. I called him a son of a toad. I called him all the other things he had called me. And then I called him a few additional things. I came from the West, where men knew how to swear, and I wasn't going to let any mangy shack of a measly New England jerk put it over me in vividness and vigor of language. At first the shack tried to laugh it down. Then he made the mistake of attempting to reply. I let out a few more links, and I cut him to the raw, and therein rubbed winged and flaming epitaphs. Nor was my fine frenzy all whim and literary. I was indignant at this vile creature who, in default of a dollar, would consign me to three months of slavery. Furthermore, I had a sneaking idea that he got a drag out of the constable fees. But I fixed him. I lacerated his feelings and pride several dollars' worth. He tried to scare me by threatening to come in after me and kick the stuffing out of me. In return, I promised to kick him in the face while he was climbing in. The advantage of position was with me, and he saw it. So he kept the door shut and called for help from the rest of the train crew. I could hear them answering and crunching through the gravel to him. And all the time the other door was unlatched, and they didn't know it. And in the meantime the gay cat was ready to die with fear. Oh, I was a hero, with my line of retreat straight behind me. I slanged the shack and his mates till they threw the door open, and I could see their infuriated faces in the shine of the lanterns. It was all very simple to them. They had us cornered in the car, and they were going to come in and manhandle us. They started. I didn't kick anybody in the face. I jerked the opposite door open, and the gay cat and I went out. 
the train crew took after us. We went over, if I remember correctly, a stone fence, but I have no doubts of recollection about where we found ourselves. In the darkness I promptly fell over a gravestone. The gay cat sprawled over another, and then we got the chase of our lives through that graveyard. The ghosts must have thought we were going some. So did the train crew, for when we emerged from the graveyard and plunged across a road into a dark wood, the shacks gave up the pursuit and went back to their train. A little later that night, the gay cat and I found ourselves at the well of a farmhouse. We were after a drink of water, but we noticed a small rope that ran down one side of the well. We hauled it up and found on the end of it a gallon can of cream. And that is as near as I got to the quarries of Rutland, Vermont. When hobos pass the word along concerning a town, that the bulls is horse avoid that town, or, if you must, go through softly. There are some towns that one must always go through softly. Such a town was Cheyenne on the Union Pacific. It had a national reputation for being horse and it was all due to the efforts of one Jeff Carr, if I remember his name aright. Jeff Carr could size up the front of a hobo on the instant. He never entered into discussion. In the one moment he sized up the hobo, and in the next he struck out with both fists, a club, or anything else he had handy. After he had manhandled the hobo, he started him out of town with a promise of worse if he ever saw him again. Jeff Carr knew the game. North, south, east, and west, to the uttermost confines of the United States, Canada and Mexico included, the manhandled hobos carried the word that Cheyenne was horstile. Fortunately, I never encountered Jeff Carr. I passed through Cheyenne in a blizzard. There were eighty-four hobos with me at the time. The strength of numbers made us pretty nonchalant on most things, but not on Jeff Carr. The connotation of Jeff Carr stunned our imagination, numbed our virility, and the whole gang was mortally scared of meeting him. It rarely pays to stop and enter into explanations with bulls when they look horse A swift getaway is the thing to do. It took me some time to learn this, but the finishing touch was put upon me by a bull in New York City. Ever since that time, it has been an automatic process with me to make a run for it when I see a bull reaching for me. This automatic process has become a mainspring of conduct in me, wound up and ready for instant release. I shall never get over it. Should I be eighty years old, hobbling along the street on crutches, and should a policeman suddenly reach out for me, I know I'd drop the crutches and run like a deer. The finishing touch to my education in bulls was received on a hot summer afternoon in New York City. It was during a week of scorching weather. I had got into the habit of throwing my feet in the morning and of spending the afternoon in the little park that is hard by Newspaper Row and the City Hall. It was near there that I could buy from pushcart men current books that had been injured in the making or binding for a few cents each. Then, right in the park itself, were little booths where one could buy glorious, ice-cold, sterilized milk and buttermilk at a penny a glass. Every afternoon I sat on a bench and read, and went on a milk debauch. I got away with from five to ten glasses each afternoon. It was dreadfully hot weather. So here I was, a meek and studious milk-drinking hobo, and behold what I got for it. One afternoon I arrived at the park, a fresh book purchase under my arm, and a tremendous buttermilk thirst under my shirt. In the middle of the street, in front of City Hall, I noticed, as I came along heading for the buttermilk booth, that a crowd had formed. It was right where I was crossing the street, so I stopped to see the cause of the collection of curious men. At first I could see nothing. Then from the sounds I heard, and from a glimpse I caught, I knew that it was a bunch of gaymans playing peewee. Now, Pee-wee is not permitted in the streets of New York. I didn't know that, but I learned pretty lively. I had paused possibly thirty seconds, in which time I had learned the cause of the crowd, when I heard a gammon yell, Bull! The gammons knew their business. They ran. I didn't. The crowd broke up immediately and started for the sidewalk on both sides of the street. I started for the sidewalk on the park side. There must have been fifty men, who had been in the original crowd, who were heading in the same direction. We were loosely strung out. I noticed the bull, a strapping policeman in a gray suit. He was coming along the middle of the street, without haste, merely sauntering. 
I noticed casually that he changed his course and was heading obliquely for the same sidewalk that I was heading for directly. He sauntered along, threading the strung-out crowd, and I noticed that his course and mine would cross each other. I was so innocent of wrongdoing that in spite of my education in bulls and their ways, I apprehended nothing. I never dreamed that bull was after me. Out of my respect for the law, I was actually all ready to pause the next moment and let him cross in front of me. The pause came all right, but it was not of my volition. Also, it was a backward pause. Without warning, that bull had suddenly launched out at me on the chest with both hands. At the same moment, verbally, he cast the bar sinister on my genealogy. All of my free American blood boiled. All my liberty-loving ancestors clamored at me. What do you mean? I demanded. You see, I wanted an explanation. And I got it. Bang! His club came down on top of my head, and I was reeling backward like a drunken man, the curious faces of the onlookers billowing up and down like the waves of the sea, my precious book falling from under my arm into the dirt, the bull advancing with the club, ready for another blow. And in that dizzy moment I had a vision. I saw that club descending many times upon my head. I saw myself, bloody and battered and hard-looking, in a police court. I heard a charge of disorderly conduct, profane language, resisting an officer, and a few other things, read by a clerk. And I saw myself across in Blackwell's Island. Oh, I knew the game. I lost all interest in explanations. I didn't stop to pick up my precious unread book. I turned and ran. I was pretty sick, but I ran. And run I shall to my dying day whenever a bull begins to explain with a club. Why, years after my tramping days, when I was a student in the University of California, one night I went to the circus. After the show and the concert, I lingered on to watch the working of the transportation machinery of a great circus. The circus was leaving that night. By a bonfire I came upon a bunch of small boys. There were about twenty of them, and as they talked with one another, I learned that they were going to run away with the circus. Now the circus men didn't want to be bothered with this mess of urchins, and a telephone to police headquarters had coppered the play. A squad of ten policemen had been dispatched to the scene to arrest the small boys for violating the nine o'clock curfew ordinance. The policemen surrounded the bonfire and crept up close to it in the darkness. At the signal, they made a rush, each policeman grabbing at the youngsters as he would grab into a basket of squirming eels. Now I didn't know anything about the coming of the police, and when I saw the sudden eruption of brass-buttoned, helmeted bulls, each of them reaching with both hands, all the forces and stability of my being were overthrown. Remained only the automatic process to run. And I ran. I didn't know I was running. I didn't know anything. It was, as I have said, automatic. There was no reason for me to run. I was not a hobo. I was a citizen of that community. It was my hometown. I was guilty of no wrongdoing. I was a college man. I had even got my name in the papers, and I wore good clothes that had never been slept in. And yet I ran, blindly, madly, like a startled deer for over a block. And when I came to myself, I noted that I was still running. It required a positive effort of will to stop those legs of mine. No, I'll never get over it. I can't help it. When a bull reaches, I run. Besides, I have an unhappy faculty for getting into jail. I have been in jail more times since I was a hobo than when I was one. I start out on a Sunday morning with a young lady on a bicycle ride. Before we can get outside the city limits, we are arrested for passing a pedestrian on the sidewalk. I resolve to be more careful. The next time I am on a bicycle, it is night time and my acetylene gas lamp is misbehaving. I cherish the sickly flame carefully because of the ordinance. I am in a hurry, but I ride at a snail's pace so as not to jar out the flickering flame. I reach the city limits. I am beyond the jurisdiction of the ordinance, and I proceed to scorch to make up for lost time. And half a mile farther on I am pinched by a bull, and the next morning I forfeit my bail in the police court. The city had treacherously extended its limits into a mile of the country, and I didn't know that was all. 
I remember my inalienable right of free speech and peaceable assemblage, and I get up on a soapbox to trot out the particular economic bees that buzz in my bonnet. And a bull takes me off that box and leads me to the city prison, and after that I get out on bail. It's no use. In Korea, I used to be arrested about every other day. It was the same thing in Manchuria. The last time I was in Japan, I broke into jail under the pretext of being a Russian spy. It wasn't my pretext, but it got me into jail just the same. There is no hope for me. I am fated to do the Prisoner of Shalon stunt yet. This is prophecy. I once hypnotized a bull on Boston Common. It was past midnight and he had me dead to rights. But before I got done with him, he had ponied up a silver quarter and given me the address of an all-night restaurant. Then there was a bull in Bristol, New Jersey, who caught me and let me go, and heaven knows he had provocation enough to put me in jail. I hit him the hardest I'll wager he was ever hit in his life. It happened this way. About midnight I nailed a freight out of Philadelphia. The shacks ditched me. She was pulling out slowly through the maze of tracks and switches of the freight yards. I nailed her again, and again I was ditched. You see, I had to nail her outside, for she was a through freight with every door locked and sealed. The second time I was ditched, the shack gave me a lecture. He told me I was risking my life, that it was a fast freight, and that she went some. I told him I was used to going some myself, but it was no go. He said he wouldn't permit me to commit suicide, and I hit the grit. But I nailed her a third time, getting in between on the bumpers. They were the most meager bumpers I had ever seen. I do not refer to the real bumpers, the iron bumpers that are connected by the coupling link and that pound and grind on each other. What I refer to are the beams, like huge cleats, that cross the ends of freight cars just above the bumpers. When one rides the bumpers, he stands on these cleats, one foot on each, the bumpers between his feet and just beneath. But the beams or cleats I found myself on were not the broad, generous ones that at that time were usually on boxcars. On the contrary, they were very narrow, not more than an inch and a half in breadth. I couldn't get half of the width of my sole on them. Then there was nothing to which to hold with my hands. True, there were the ends of the two boxcars, but those ends were flat, perpendicular surfaces. There were no grips. I could only press the flats of my palms against the car ends for support. But that would have been all right if the cleats from my feet had been decently wide. As the freight got out of Philadelphia, she began to hit up speed. Then I understood what the shack had meant by suicide. The freight went faster and faster. She was a through freight, and there was nothing to stop her. On that section of the Pennsylvania, four tracks run side by side, and my eastbound freight didn't need to worry about passing westbound freights, nor about being overtaken by eastbound expresses. She had the track to herself, and she used it. I was in a precarious situation. I stood with the mere edges of my feet on the narrow projections, the palms of my hands pressing desperately against the flat perpendicular ends of each car. And those cars moved, and moved individually, up and down and back and forth. Did you ever see a circus rider standing on two running horses, with one foot on the back of each horse? Well, that was what I was doing, with several differences. The circus rider had the reins to hold on to, while I had nothing. He stood on the broad soles of his feet, while I stood on the edges of mine. He bent his legs and body, gaining the strength of the arch in his posture and achieving the stability of a low center of gravity while I was compelled to stand upright and keep my legs straight. He rode face forward, while I was riding sideways. And also, if he fell off, he'd only get a roll in the sawdust, while I'd have been ground to pieces beneath the wheels. And that freight was certainly going some, roaring and shrieking, swinging madly around curves, thundering over trestles, one car end bumping up when the other was jarring down, or jerking to the right at the same moment the other was lurching to the left, and with me all the while praying and hoping for the train to stop. But she didn't stop. She didn't have to. For the first, last, and only time on the road, I got all I wanted. I abandoned the bumpers and managed to get out on the side ladder. It was ticklish work, for I had never encountered car ends that were so parsimonious of handholds and footholds as those car ends were. 
I heard the engine whistling, and I felt the speed easing down. I knew the train wasn't going to stop, but my mind was made up to chance it if she slowed down sufficiently. The right-of-way at this point took a curve, crossed a bridge over a canal, and cut through the town of Bristol. This combination compelled slow speed. I clung on to the side ladder and waited. I didn't know it was the town of Bristol we were approaching. I did not know what necessitated slackening in speed. All I knew was that I wanted to get off. I strained my eyes in the dark for a street crossing on which to land. I was pretty well down the train, and before my car was in the town the engine was past the station and I could feel her making speed again. Then came the street. It was too dark to see how wide it was or what was on the other side. I knew I needed all of that street if I was to remain on my feet after I struck. I dropped off on the near side. It sounds easy. By dropped off, I mean just this. I, first of all, on the side ladder, thrust my body forward as far as I could in the direction the train was going. This is to give as much space as possible in which to gain a backward momentum when I swung off. Then I swung, swung out and backward, backward with all my might, and let go, at the same time throwing myself backward as if I intended to strike the ground on the back of my head. The whole effort was to overcome as much as possible the primary forward momentum the train had imparted to my body. When my feet hit the grit, my body was laying backward on the air at an angle of forty-five degrees. I had reduced the forward momentum some, for when my feet struck I did not immediately pitch forward on my face. Instead, my body rose to the perpendicular and began to incline forward. In point of fact, my body proper still retained much momentum, while my feet, through contact with the earth, had lost all their momentum. This momentum the feet had lost I had to supply anew by lifting them as rapidly as I could and running them forward in order to keep them under my forward-moving body. The result was that my feet beat a rapid and explosive tattoo clear across the street. I didn't dare stop them. If I had, I'd have pitched forward. It was up to me to keep on going. I was an involuntary projectile, worrying about what was on the other side of the street and hoping that it wouldn't be a stone wall or a telegraph pole. And just then I hit something. Horrors! I saw it just the instant before the disaster. Of all things, a bull, standing there in the darkness. We went down together, rolling over and over, and the automatic process was such in that miserable creature that in the moment of impact he reached out and clutched me and never let go. We were both knocked out, and he held on to a very lamb-like hobo while he recovered. If that bull had any imagination, he must have thought me a traveler from other worlds, the man from Mars just arriving, for in the darkness he hadn't seen me swing from the train. In fact, his first words were, where did you come from? His next words, and before I had time to answer, were, I've got a good mind to run you in. This latter, I am convinced, was likewise automatic. He was a really good bull at heart, for after I had told him a story and helped brush off his clothes, he gave me until the next freight to get out of town. I stipulated two things. First, that the freight be eastbound, and second, that it should not be a through freight with all doors sealed and locked. To this he agreed, and thus, by the terms of the Treaty of Bristol, I escaped being pinched. I remember another night in that part of the country when I just missed another bull. If I had hit him, I'd have telescoped him, for I was coming down from above, all holds free, with several other bulls one jump behind and reaching for me. This is how it happened. I had been lodging in a livery stable in Washington. I had a box stall and unnumbered horse blankets all to myself. In return for such sumptuous accommodation, I took care of a string of horses each morning. I might have been there yet, if it hadn't been for the bulls. One evening, about nine o'clock, I returned to the stable to go to bed, and found a crap game in full blast. It had been a market day, and all the negroes had money. It would be well to explain the lay of the land. The livery stable faced on two streets. I entered the front, passed through the office, and came to the alley between two rows of stalls that ran the length of the building and opened out on the other street. 
Midway along this alley, beneath a gas jet and between the rows of horses, were about forty negroes. I joined them as an onlooker. I was broke and couldn't play. A coon was making passes and not dragging down. He was riding his luck, and with each pass the total stake doubled. All kinds of money lay on the floor. It was fascinating. With each pass, the chances increased tremendously against the coon making another pass. The excitement was intense. And just then, there came a thundering smash on the big doors that opened on the back street. A few of the negroes bolted in the opposite direction. I paused from my flight a moment to grab at the all kinds of money on the floor. This wasn't theft. It was merely custom. Every man who hadn't run was grabbing. The doors crashed open and swung in, and through them surged a squad of bulls. We surged the other way. It was dark in the office, and the narrow door would not permit all of us to pass out to the street at the same time. Things became congested. A coon took a dive through the window, taking the sash along with him and followed by other coons. At our rear, the bulls were nailing prisoners. A big coon and myself made a dash at the door at the same time. He was bigger than I, and he pivoted me and got through first. The next instant a club squatted him on the head, and he went down like a steer. Another squad of bulls was waiting outside for us. They knew they couldn't stop the rush with their hands, and so they were swinging with their clubs. I stumbled over the fallen coon who had pivoted me, ducked a swat from a club, dived between a bull's legs, and was free. And then how I ran! There was a lean mulatto just in front of me, and I took his pace. He knew the town better than I did, and I knew that in the way he ran lay safety. But he, on the other hand, took me for a pursuing bull. He never looked around, he just ran. My wind was good, and I hung on to his pace and nearly killed him. In the end, he stumbled weakly, went down on his knees, and surrendered to me. And when he discovered I wasn't a bull, all that saved me was that he didn't have any wind left in him. That was why I left Washington. Not on account of the mulatto, but on account of the bulls. I went down to the depot and caught the first blind out on a Pennsylvania Railroad Express. After the train got good and underway, and I noted the speed she was making, a misgiving smote me. This was a four-track railroad, and the engines took water on the fly. Hobos had long since warned me never to ride the first blind on trains where the engines took water on the fly. And now, let me explain. Between the tracks are shallow metal troughs. As the engine, at full speed, passes above, a sort of chute drops down into the trough. The result is that all the water in the trough rushes up the chute and fills the tender. Somewhere along between Washington and Baltimore, as I sat on the platform of the blind, a fine spray began to fill the air. It did no harm. Aha, thought I, it's all a bluff, this taking water on the fly being bad for the bow on the first blind. What does this little spray amount to? Then I began to marvel at the device. This was railroading. Talk about your primitive western railroading. And just then the tender filled up, and it hadn't reached the end of the trough. A tidal wave of water poured over the back of the tender and down upon me. I was soaked to the skin, as wet as if I had fallen overboard. The train pulled into Baltimore. As is the custom in great eastern cities, the railroad ran beneath the level of the streets on the bottom of a big cut. As the train pulled into the lighted depot, I made myself as small as possible on the blind. But a railroad bull saw me and gave chase. Two more joined him. I was past the depot, and I ran straight on down the track. I was in a sort of trap. On each side of me rose the steep walls of the cut, and if I ever essayed them and failed, I knew I'd slide back into the clutches of the bulls. I ran on and on, studying the walls of the cut for a favorable place to climb up. At last I saw such a place. It came, just after I had passed under a bridge, that carried a level street across the cut. Up the steep slope I went, clawing hand and foot. The three railroad bulls were clawing up right after me. At the top, I found myself in a vacant lot. On one side was a low wall that separated it from the street. There was no time for minute investigation. They were at my heels. I headed for the wall and vaulted it. And right there was where I got the surprise of my life. One is used to thinking that one side of a wall is just as high as the other side. But that wall was different. 
You see, the vacant lot was much higher than the level of the street. On my side the wall was low, but on the other side, well, as I came soaring over the top, all holds free, it seemed to me that I was falling feet first, plump into an abyss. There beneath me, on the sidewalk, under the light of a street lamp, was a bull. I guess it was nine or ten feet down to the sidewalk, but in the shock of surprise in mid-air it seemed twice that distance. I straightened out in the air and came down. At first I thought I was going to land on the bull. My clothes did brush him as my feet struck the sidewalk with explosive impact. It was a wonder he didn't drop dead, for he hadn't heard me coming. It was the man from Mars stunt over again. The bull did jump. He shied away from me like a horse from an auto, and then he reached for me. I didn't stop to explain. I left that to my pursuers, who were dropping over the wall rather gingerly. But I got a chase all right. I ran up one street and down another, dodged around corners, and at last got away. After spending some of the coin I'd got from the crap game and killing off an hour of time, I came back to the railroad cut, just outside the lights of the depot, and waited for a train. My blood had cooled down, and I shivered miserably, what of my wet clothes. At last a train pulled into the station. I lay low in the darkness and successfully boarded her when she pulled out, taking good care this time to make the second blind. No more water on the fly in mine. The train ran forty miles to the first stop. I got off in a lighted depot that was strangely familiar. I was back in Washington. In some way, during the excitement of the getaway in Baltimore, running through strange streets, dodging and turning and retracing, I had got turned around. I had taken the train out the wrong way. I had lost a night's sleep, I had been soaked to the skin, I had been chased for my life, and for all my pains I was back where I had started. Oh, no, life on the road is not all beer and skittles. But I didn't go back to the livery stable. I had done some pretty successful grabbing, and I didn't want to reckon up with the coons. So I caught the next train out and ate my breakfast in Baltimore. End of Chapter 9 End of the Road by Jack London Recording by Barry Eads